Our message today is based on these words from Matthew chapter 11. I will begin reading at verse 2 where it says, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare you your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is God's word. Uh, so many of you know, uh, I, have, I have three kids. Uh, my older two are in their 20s. And they're both dating significant others right now. And so I have probably been asked maybe a dozen times in the last year, sometimes by you, so dad, do you think this is the one? And the answer is always the same. I don't know, right? I don't know. Um, But that's a pretty significant question. Is this the one? Is he the one? Is she the one? Are you the one? And, but it's, it's not just a question that's asked when it comes to finding a spouse. It's a question that's asked. You can go to SPCA to adopt a dog or a cat, and you, you, you look at every one of them. You analyze them. Are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? Or you, you, drive, you go to Dolan Toyota to pick a new car, and you look at all those cars on the lot, and you say, are you the one that's going to get me from point A to point B? Or, or what about this one? Or, or, or maybe you procrastinate your gift buying until December 24th, and you, you go and you see those half-empty shelves, and you're like, oh, are you the one that's going to keep me out of the doghouse? Are you the one that's going to, you know, satisfy my needs right now? Are you uh, the one? Now, the answer to some of those questions, or when we ask that question, sometimes does not make a difference in the world, depending on what the context is behind that question. But when John... When John asked that question in our reading for today, it made all the difference in the world. As he said, are you the one, Jesus? Are you the one that was to come? Now, what maybe surprises us that John is even asking uh, that question in the first place, because if there's anybody in all of, of, of the history of the world that should have known that Jesus was, in fact, the one, it would have been John. I mean, he knew Jesus was the one before he was even born, right? When when John was inside his mom, he he leaped for joy when fetus Jesus came for a visit. Or or later on, when when John's preaching and all these people are there by the river by him, what does he do? He points to Jesus, look, look, there's there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or Or when... When Jesus comes to John to be baptized, and John says, whoa, 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 there's no way I'm baptizing you. I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. I know who you are. And after Jesus says, no, this is what you're going to do, what happens? John hears that booming voice from heaven. This is my son. He sees the dove come down and land on Jesus. John knew without a doubt Jesus was the one. So Why? Why does he ask the question? Jesus, are you the one? Or should we expect someone else? I don't know why he asked the question. But I have my guesses. And I think the Holy Spirit gives us a little hint as to why maybe at this particular time John asked the question. Did you see the description of John? John, who was in prison. You know, when I look at my own life, when, I, when do I question the identity of Jesus or the identity of God? 
It's often when I'm in my own metaphorical prison. When times are less than ideal. You know, Jesus, are you the one that I should trust? How come things aren't going so well in my life right now? Are, are you the one? You know, Jesus, you tell me in your word that you have a plan for me, plan to give me hope and a future, and yet how come it seems like everybody else is thriving and I'm barely surviving? Are, are you really the one? Jesus, you promise. You promise to work everything out for my good. Uh, yeah, when are you going to get around to that? Uh, Are you really the one? When we find ourselves in a less than ideal situation, that's maybe when we ask that or a similar question. And yet, it really doesn't matter so much why you and I ask the question. It doesn't matter so much why John asked this question. What makes the difference is the answer. And we look at how Jesus answered John's questioning mind. He he sent the disciples, he sent John's disciples back and said, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Now, it's rather interesting the way that Jesus answered John's question. I mean, he could have just said, yep, I am. And that could have been enough, right? Uh, Maybe John sent a little parchment uh, with with his disciples, and maybe he just had a check check box here. You know, he said, Jesus, are you the one? Check yes or no. And Jesus could have checked yes and sent it back. But what does Jesus do? He uses the comment section on that little questionnaire, and he, and he goes into all these details. And these are, these are kind of significant details because these are not original words to Jesus. He's borrowing these words. He's using these words from the Old Testament prophets. You heard some of them in our first reading for today from Isaiah chapter 35 and elsewhere in Isaiah. Elsewhere in all, for over a thousand years, God's people have been preparing for the Messiah. And for over a thousand years, the prophets have said things like, this is what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to give sight to the blind. And this is what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to make the lame walk. And this is what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to heal those who are sick. He's going to cleanse those who have leprosy. He's going to unstop the ears of those who are deaf. The, the The Messiah is going to do this, 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 and this, this. And Jesus uses that as his basis for his response. And he says, John, this is what I'm doing. See, he could have just let his actions speak for themselves. But what does he do? He, he vouches for his identity on the authority of scriptures. And that's a pretty important point for us to consider today. That Jesus vouches for his identity on the authority of scriptures. Because you go back to the way that you and I look for the identity of Jesus in our life. You know, there are so many times when I'm saying, Jesus, why did you do this? Or why didn't you do that? Jesus, why did you allow, you know, like what happened in Oxford Township, Michigan? Uh, not too long ago. Why, 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 why? And so many times when we are questioning the identity of Jesus, are we saying, are you the one? It's because we are looking for a Jesus that doesn't exist. We are looking for a Jesus that is a fake Jesus. We are looking for a Jesus that fits my mind instead of one that fits Scripture. But the big question is, what would you rather have? Do you want a Messiah who fits your brain? Or do you want a Messiah who fits the Bible? And by pointing John back to scriptures in this particular point, you see that, that the Messiah even, even outdoes what we sometimes expect. I mean, you look at this, this list that Jesus picks here. 
Oh, yeah, you know, the, the, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the, you know, the, the, the sick are healed, and, and, and the deaf hear. Those are, those are usually what we look for in a Jesus. Jesus, I want you to do stuff for me. I want you to show your power. I want you to heal. And Jesus vouches for that. He says, oh, yeah, I can do that. I have the power to do that. But he doesn't stop there. I mean, you look at those last two parts of, of his answers, and the dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. That, that is the Messiah that you and I need. And that is the Messiah that you and I have. Backed up, vouched for by the authority of scriptures. And what's interesting after that is not only does Jesus vouch for his own identity on the authority of scriptures, he then goes on to authoritatively give an identity to those who follow him. So, so the disciples, John's disciples, return with this message back to John, and now Jesus addresses the crowd. You see, the crowd had expectations for John as well. Uh, just like many of you, I know if you're a first-time visitor or a first-time guest with us today, you, you had expectations uh, about coming in, into this building today. You know, what, what's going to be talked about? What's the music going to be like? What's the setting going to be like? What's it going to look like? You have, you have all these expectations. Well, people had expectations for John as well. As they went to see him preaching in the desert, you know, what's he going to be wearing? Uh, you know, what's, what's he going to be what's he going to be talking about? What's he going to sound like? And, and so Jesus addresses their expectations in very similar verbiage as, as John had expectations for him. Remember, John said, Jesus, are you the one? Well, Jesus uses that same wording here. He says, this, this is the one about John. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Now, now there, there's two things maybe to note in, in the way that Jesus addresses their expectations. I mean, first of all, you, you just see what a, the, the way that he, he holds John up. You know, what a privilege for John to be called, this is the one who's going to pave the way for the Messiah. And then Jesus goes on to say, truly I tell you, which is always an attention-getting phrase that Jesus uses, Whenever he's got something really important, he says, yeah, truly, I tell you, there's no one greater among women, born of women, than John. I mean, what, what words of commendation. Way to hold them up, Jesus. That's one thing to note, to see the privilege that John had. How awesome to be recognized by Jesus as his forerunner and to be greater than anybody else born of women. But the second thing to note is just as Jesus' identity was vouched for by Scripture, he vouches for John's identity through Scripture. This is the one about whom it is written. And so if Jesus vouches for his own identity on the authority of Scripture, if he vouches for the identity of John on the authority of Scripture, that maybe begs the question, how does Jesus vouch for my identity on the authority of scriptures? You know, one thing uh, that I like to use as an approach to reading scriptures, and I'd encourage you to try this out, uh, is to, to kind of put yourself into the shoes of the people that are in that section of God's word that you're reading. I just find it so helpful to, to maybe make it come to give some color to what is normally black and white. And, and it, it's just an interesting way to look at something. And you can change people, you know, within the account. It gives you a little bit different perspective. So if I, was, if I was going to use that approach to this section, I'd say, oh, man, you know, what would it be like to be John? And I could go through all the challenges of maybe being in a less than ideal situation and, and thinking about the identity of Jesus. How is he going to help me through this? Or maybe I could go through, the, you know, what's it like to be in the shoes of John's disciples 
Oddly enough, I would find some comfort in saying, oh, man, even my, me- my spiritual mentor has some questions. That makes me feel better sometimes, right? Or, or maybe if I would, if I would um, take on the, uh, try on the shoes of the crowd, I, I maybe would think about, you know, what are my expectations for preachers? What are my expectations for going to church? You know, what do I expect to be talked about? And, and so you can, you can go through this whole lesson and say, well, yeah, this is what it would be like to wear all those people's shoes. But here's what's interesting about this section. We don't have to try on anybody else's shoes. Why? Because your shoes are there. You're talked about individually in this section of God's Word. Did you see it? Do you see you in Matthew chapter 11? It's maybe not obvious. It doesn't jump off the page, but this is the value of, of studying God's Word together once in a while. We can glean from one another. You know, as I sit with you in Bible study or as we, as we talk about God's Word, I love the insights and the questions uh, that I get from you. And so maybe, maybe it's valuable to, to hear other insights once in a while. And, and this would maybe be one of those sections. Because if we don't see, if you don't see you in this section, let me Let me show you where you're at. It's in the very last verse. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And maybe you're still saying, I still don't see me, right? Uh, In order to see you in that last verse, in order for me to see me in that last verse, uh, we have to understand some of this phraseology, especially that phrase, kingdom of heaven. Now that phrase is used in numerous ways throughout the Bible. Uh, But in the context of John, whenever that phrase is used with John the Baptist, it does not mean like the kingdom of heaven where you and I are going to go someday where we get to sit in all glory. John loves to use that phrase to talk about the era of Jesus. Just a few chapters before this, John says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He's pointing out that there's going to be a major shift that all the Old Testament prophets and, and these forerunners, John included, they had one job to do, and that was to point ahead, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. But he says, but now it's almost here. And now it's an era, the Messiah has come. There's a complete shift from an era of, of, of what was of promises foretold to promises that are fulfilled. It's, it's the, what you and I might call the New Testament era. That you and I don't have to ask anymore the question, are you the one, Jesus? Because we can definitively ask from our perspective, he was the one. The Messiah has come. And Jesus says, Because you and I live in that era, we're greater than John. Not by status, not by importance, but by privilege. Isn't that awesome? Consider that privilege, that that is how Jesus identifies you. That is your identity in Christ, that you are are greater than John in your privilege. And, I, you know, I, you think about that, how much through life, you know, we, we get identified. Our identity is questioned. Or, and again, sometimes it's, it can be very trivial things. Uh, you can be at the grocery store after church today, and, and someone might, you might come into the store and say, oh, well, you know, we're were you the one that just helped that little old granny put her groceries into the, into the trunk? You know, that's a good identity. But you might also be asked, are you the one who cut off granny as she was walking? You know, that's a bad identity. Uh, but in those cases, yeah, again, it, your identity doesn't make a whole huge difference. But how Jesus identifies you with the authority of scriptures Talk about self-esteem raising. You are great. You are, are privileged to live when you do. 
and to have had the good news preached to you. And I would just ask that each of us consider and really cherish that privilege, especially in the coming weeks as we head into Christmas here, that we consider what a privilege it is to live in an era where we know that Jesus is the Messiah who has come. Because what does that mean? That means that in less than two weeks, you and I can all gather here and we can peek into a feed box. And we don't have to ask, what child is this? We can say, wow, what a child this is. This is God. Because of the privilege that we have, we can, we can hear the angels sing in less than two weeks, peace. And we know what they mean. We know that it means that we have been reconciled with God. Because we know that that little baby in that feed box didn't stay in a manger, but he went to a cross. It means that already today, you and I can run out of here with the shepherd saying, hey, let me tell everyone what we have seen and heard. Because through the eyes of scriptures, we have seen. We have seen that Jesus is the Messiah who has come. We have seen that Jesus is the one. And we don't have to expect anyone or anything else. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts 